Good evening, everyone. I'm Steve Edwards, the Executive Director of the Institute of Politics, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to a very special event tonight. This is the culmination of not only uh, 40 years to date in politics for our founding director, the director of the Institute of Politics, David Axelrod, but the culmination of, what, about a year and a half of writing a book that we've all watched you arduously. The culmination of my shirking my responsibilities <laughs> to the Institute of Politics. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> so, hardly, hardly. So, it's very exciting for us to have all of you here tonight for this conversation with uh, our good friend and Chicago Tribune columnist, Eric Zorn. Before we begin, I wanted to, yeah, a round of applause for Eric as well. Um, Will Fernandez here, who's the senior co-chair of our student executive board, will formally introduce our program, but I wanted to do just a few bits of housekeeping before we get in. The first is to thank our good friends at International House here for hosting tonight's event um, as part of their ongoing series. So a round of applause for our colleagues here at iHouse, this beautiful room. Uh, we also want to remind you that tonight's event is part of our ongoing speaker series throughout the academic year where we bring uh, leading political figures to campus to share their insights on key issues of the day. Tomorrow night we'll, we will be back um, here on campus just across the way at Ida Noyes on the third floor theater to explore ballot initiatives and citizen democracy looking at gay marriage, the minimum wage, marriage equality, um, and marijuana laws as a panel discussion tomorrow at 6 p.m. We encourage all of you to join us for that. You can find out more about all of our events on our website at politics.uchicago.edu, where we also encourage you to sign up for our email. Um, tonight's event is being recorded. You can catch this and other events in our speaker series through podcasts by going to iTunes U. And as is customary here at the Institute of Politics, we will open up the floor to you for your questions a bit later in the program tonight. Um, when we do, we'll place a microphone in the center of the audience. We ask that you line up behind the microphone, and so we can get to as many of you as possible, we ask that you keep your questions short and to the point. So without further ado, let me turn to the senior co-chair of our student executive board, Will Fernandez. Will is a fourth year here in the college, majoring in American history. In addition to his leadership at the Institute of Politics, Will is the founder of the Chicago Youth Philanthropy Group, which looks at using philanthropic giving and social justice to create a better world. Please join me in welcoming Will Fernandez to the podium. Will. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, tonight, I have the distinguished pleasure to introduce a man who has left an undeniable mark upon this campus, this city, and this country. David Axelrod has become a living testament to the importance of public service and works each and every day to ensure that the next generation has the tools and knowledge necessary to participate. Coming to the Hyde Park community at the age of 17, David was, and I quote, a hyper kid smart enough to get by, but too distracted to sit still for hours contemplating Aristotle. <laughs> it would be this community that David would flourish as a journalist and political consultant for over 40 years, working for publications such as the Hyde Park Herald and the Chicago Tribune, as well as candidates such as Senator Paul Simon, Mayor Harold Washington, and President Barack Obama. Tonight we come together to dive deeply into David's new memoir, Believer, My 40 Years in Politics. From sitting on a mailbox in Stuyvesant Town, New York, listening rapturously to the words of a young John F. Kennedy, to directing the historic 2008 presidential campaign, David has lived a life fully committed to public service while maintaining his strident idealism. When David first announced the opening of the Institute of Politics three years ago in this very room, he called this project an emotional homecoming. He was reminded of the blessings that this community had given him while looking out on an audience that had friends, family, and yes, students. Students who would soon become engaged with his institute. Students who would find their own passions for politics and public service, working with talented practitioners here in Hyde Park as well as abroad. I was lucky enough to be one of those students at the very beginning, sitting in the back row probably right up there on top of the balcony. And I had no idea what this experience was going to become. To say the very least, the opportunity has changed my life, and I know I'm not the only one. David, on behalf of all of the students that have and will participate with the Institute, I want to personally thank you. 
We are so grateful for everything that you have brought to this community, and I am humbled to call you a mentor and a friend. Thank you. And now to the main event. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our Institute Director David Axelrod and Chicago Tribune columnist Eric Zorn for tonight's discussion. David, I want, I want to start with a story that does not appear in this book. And it takes place in the, the early 80s. The book is 80s. 489 pages, Somehow so you can find one story from the this book. <laughs> the story is, is David and I used to play on the Tribune basketball team. <laughs> And uh, we played in, this, in the Park District League down, uh, down on, uh, at, at Chicago and Lakeshore Drive. And we played the teams of lawyers and other, other media teams. One game I remember very well, we were down by five points with about 10 seconds to go. Any of you ever seen David play basketball? He has a very unorthodox looking <laughs> shot. And it's common for other teams to underestimate it because it goes in a couple times and they think, well, this guy's getting lucky but he keeps making it, and it's, it's an incredibly accurate shot, and he's a fun guy to play with. So David comes down with 10 seconds to go, we're down by five, David throws up a three-point shot, goes in, we're down by two. The other team, rather than calling a timeout, or, or you know, they just let the clock run, so the guy says, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw this ball the length of the court, um, because that way, no matter if they catch it down there, it doesn't matter, so he heaves it up, and you remember this, the rafters were kinda low, yeah. it hits the rafters, comes down, and I swear that this story has not exaggerated over the years like some media stories have been. Um, so it's our ball out of bounds, and they think we're going to be looking for the inside pass to, get, to tie the game up. So I'm underneath the basket. I just throw it out to David at about half court. He throws up a three-point shot. It goes in, and we win the game. <laughs> and you remember this? Uh, I do now. <laughs> you yeah. do now. I, if I had remembered it before, it would have been in the book. <laughs> it would have been in the book. <laughs> So you know, I'm thinking that this guy has absolutely used up his last miracle in, in life. And then, of course, about 20 years later, he takes this African-American man with a funny name, the name that sounds like a, the number one enemy of the United <laughs> States, who has just gotten the stuffings kicked out of him by Bobby Rush in a congressional race, and he takes him and he basically guides his campaign to the, and, and, and to, to the United States Senate. And then four years after that, he is the message master that gets this same man to the White House. And I'm thinking, and then, and then four years after that, you helped uh, with, it, with the message and pilot him back to, to re-election against this incredible, these incredible headwinds of, uh, of, the, of the Tea Party. Um, I appreciate you leaving out the down moments. There. <laughs> well, oh, we'll get to those. There's some downsides to this. I, I'm, I'm saying that there are a lot, there are a lot of, of ups and downs here. Um, and Believer chronicles those ups and downs, and it'll take the reader along with you from these euphoric moments that many of you may remember or be part of uh, in Grant Park on election night in 2008, where you think that the world has actually changed, uh, to uh, my personal low moment, which was in, I think it was October of 2012, when the first debate mm. with uh, Romney and Obama. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and uh, Obama manages to get through that debate without mentioning Bain Capital or the 47% remark, and I'm screaming at my television set. That was my low moment, and there are lots of uh, in between. But I'm wondering, what was your, what was your lowest moment in, in this? Uh... Well, um, you know, the, the, the whole experience had um, a series of ups and downs, um, in, and I would say that the most sober moments had to do with national security and the commitment of troops, um, you know, uh, and some of those issues. I think if you work in the White House, that takes on a different quality, but, um, you know, the healthcare fight was one that had a lot of ups and downs. And there were so many times when it looked like we were done. And that included uh, the night when we, uh, Scott Brown uh, defeated Martha Coakley for the Senate seat, depriving us of the 60 votes we'd need to pass uh, a final health care plan in the Senate. And uh, that was, you know, the, the, the immediate sense was health, after this 10-month battle, health care was, uh, was done. That was a, a very low moment. Um, but, you know, you tend to remember 
less the low moments than the high moments. Obviously, the debate thing wasn't fun either, by the way. Uh, that was a, and I wrote extensively on this. Yes, I, and can you t tell me that story about, I mean, it was, the, the prep went really poorly and Obama was well, not happy with you. Well, let's just start from the beginning. The history of debates, presidential debates, have, has always been that incumbent presidents tend to do poorly in the first debate, and there are good reasons for it. First, they haven't debated in four years, and the challenger generally has been through a series of primary debates and is in fighting trim. Uh, secondly, when you're president of the United States, you're always sort of up on a pedestal, and you're never sort of one-on-one -on -one with someone on a platform who's being treated as an equal and hectoring you, and that's what happens in uh, debates, and most presidents don't react uh, well to that. Uh, there is a uh, tendency to want to be to, to defend more than uh, than deliver message. Uh, there were so many pitfalls to the first debates that we I had circled that date on my calendar months in advance as a potential problem, and I wasn't disappointed. <laughs> um, and you know, in all the prep leading up to it, the president was very uh, uh, uneven. A lot of times, he was uh, kind of irascible in. John Kerry was playing Mitt Romney, and he was being provocative, and the president would take the bait. And, uh, uh, but the biggest thing was, the presidential debates are not you know, sort of free-flowing conversations. They are uh, kind of uh, choreographed performances. Each, each person comes to deliver their set pieces when they're doing it uh, properly. Uh, and the president just was very resistant to that. He thought it was a stupid exercise and a demeaning exercise and that the public deserved, you know, more <coughs> lengthy and detailed answers and more, po and, you know, um, and so we just, you know, the night before that debate, uh, we had a run through and everybody, we were all terrified. And my colleagues uh, uh, were kind enough to assign me the responsibility to go in and tell the president that. Um, and he said, I, you know, I think that went pretty well. What do you think? And I told him what I thought. I had to make a quick calculation. Do I tell him what I think or do I lie? Um, and I told him what I thought. He reacted rather sharply use, using uh, a word that I won't use here. But I know we're in the International House. There isn't a language on, on the planet that where you, this would be anything but pejorative. <laughs> uh, and, um, and it was the only time we ever had an exchange like that. And um, uh, in fact, when he read the book, he said, I don't remember calling you that. And I said, believe me, if you're the guy who's been called that, you remember. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I actually didn't lose my, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't uh, hurt by it. What is it? Because I knew that he was expressing in his own way his own tension and uh, concern about the next day. And we, we all flew to Denver with this sense of foreboding, you know, kind of hoping against hope that it would all work out. Uh, and when we got to the locker room, uh, where he, which was his hold in this arena, he, Pluff and I went in to try and, David Pluff to try and, uh, you know, buck him up. And he said, Let's just get this over with and get out of here. Which well, is, these are not the words you want to hear well, <coughs> from the well, president. And, and as, as I recall, before, before his, his, his attitude, I mean, this may have been the speech that he gave at the convention, his attitude was, give me the ball. Oh, it was always that. You know, yes, you, you know, before his famous convention speech in 2004, just before he went out, he said, he said, don't worry, I always make my marks. And before the 2008 debate, first debate with McCain, I said, how do you feel? Because uh, I didn't. Feel, I mean, he was, pre he was, I felt fine about him. I just, the, the weight of the moment was, and he, uh, he said, uh, uh, he said, just give me the ball. That was what he said in 2008, which is a lot different than let's just get this over with and get out of here. <laughs> well, you mentioned his attitude toward debates, and I, I made a note of a passage from, uh, I think, page 485. You're talking about, about the president, and you're saying, a person's strengths almost always have a flip side. Obama's strengths are prodigious but he's not perfect or exempt from blame for some of the disappointments I hear expressed about him ever more frequently these days. That hint of moral superiority and disdain for politicians 
who put elections first, has hurt Obama as a negotiator. Mm -hmm. And it's why Biden, the politician's politician, is off, often has better luck. Mm -hmm. Talk about that aspect of, of, of his personality. Well, that I do believe himself. that. I believe people's strengths are, are almost always also their weaknesses. Uh, the, Barack Obama's strength, um, and I think it's a, a prodigious strength, is that he honestly believes that there are worse things than losing elections. He, you know, I always say the world of politics divides into two categories, uh, the people who run for office who want to be something, which is the more numerous group, and then the smaller and more admirable group of people who run for office because they want to do something, and he's squarely in that group. And, uh, you know, he uh, ran on the, uh, you know, the, the people remember some aspects of the campaign, but one of the big premises of the 2008 campaign was we had to rise above the small politics of Washington and deal with uh, not just uh, the next election, but uh, issues that face the next generation, big problems and so on, and that's what he believed. And he often um, uh, approached, you know, 80% of uh, the politicians you meet in Washington, give or take, really kind of fit into category one. I mean, when we went to, uh, talk about the health care bill, when he went to talk to the Democratic caucus right before they, uh, on the Senate side, before they considered the health care bill, he gave a great speech, one of the really great, it was off the cuff and moving, it was, you know, you, it was like the West Wing, it was just, uh, I mean, uh, honestly, it was that kind of a speech, and uh, it gave you chills, and we got in the car, and we're driving back, and he's looking out the window, and he says, what are they so scared of? I said, well, I, I think they're scared of losing their jobs. And he said, well, what's the point of being there for 30 years if you never do anything? And I said, you know, here's the thing. That's what you feel, and I know you believe it. I said, but for most of these folks, this is the best job they're ever going to have. And they'd love to do good things if they can, but if it's a choice between doing good things and being here for 30 years, they, they want to be, be here for years. 30 years. You said he hated the Senate or disliked it very much, being in the being Senate. Being in the Senate. Being in the Senate. Yeah, that's yeah. what I meant. Yeah, yeah I would, used to go and meet him when he was in the Senate. And uh, I'd stand outside the Senate chambers waiting for him, and the doors would open, and he'd come out, and he'd just walk past me saying, blah, blah, blah. That's all we do here. <laughs> all we do is talk. So, uh, so much so that, I, uh, that had he uh, not run for president, I think there's a good chance that he would have come back to Illinois and run for governor. The, uh, you talked about the, the, the theme of the campaign in 2008 was you know, fixing the broken politics of Washington. Uh, but you noted in your book, by the spring of 2010, uh, by this measure he was failing. The country was no less divided, the debate seemed no less riveted in ideology, and the perverse effect of our aggressive challenge to so many institutions was that the lobbyists hired to protect the special interests had never fared better. Hillary Clinton during the uh, primary said that he, it was, he was promising too much. Right. Did, you, did he promise too much? Well, what, yeah, I think about what she said during the primary. She said, I want to give America false hope. And as I wrote, awesome. we flayed her uh, for that because, you know, from our standpoint, and I still believe this, I don't think hope is ever false. I don't think you should, I think you should aim uh, high. What happened was uh, people really responded to him in a big way. We swept in huge, the irony is in talking about creating a better atmosphere for cooperation in Washington, we swept in huge partisan uh, majorities uh, and um, the Republican leadership, you know, Mitch McConnell, whatever you think about him or his politics, is a very shrewd, shrewd political strategist. And he made a judgment, as did some of the other leaders, that, um, okay, we're in the midst of this economic crisis. He's going to have to make some really, really hard and unpopular decisions. We're going to let him make those decisions. He's got the votes to pass it. And uh, let him live with that, and that will make us stronger uh, when we try and win some seats back in the midterm elections. And it was, you know, I, I think, you know, from the standpoint of the common wheel, it was a regrettable decision. From the standpoint of the Republican Party, it was a shrewd decision. And the more that they refused to give us cooperation on some of these big things that we had to do, uh, the more he pushed the president into a position to act as a partisan. And so he, you know, it was a decision that, that helped turn the president into a more partisan figure. Do you think that, that in retrospect, having that 60 vote, that nominal 60 vote supermajority and then the, then the majority in the House, that that hampered you in some ways? I mean, you, you talked well, about I mean, how I, that it... I, I think that there are certain burdens associated with having 
um, gaudy majorities. I, I, I would love to experiment with that again. Uh, yeah. But uh, but the truth is, you didn't have it for as long as everyone says. People say, oh, we had Congress for two years. Right. Al Franken, there was that long period where he yeah. wasn't sworn in. Then right. Ted Kennedy died. There was only a brief period when there were actually 60 votes. And they weren't a coherent 60. You had Ben Nelson, right. who was giving you grief. And right. So it right. wasn't like you had 60 votes who he would snap his fingers and say, do this. Right. Now, it is true that those first two years, you, know, you hear a lot about, you know, why can't he be more like Lyndon Johnson? Why, why can't he be more like Franklin Roosevelt? Uh, the, the truth is his first two years uh, there were uh, as productive as any since the 1960s, and he worked with those uh, numbers uh, very effectively. Um, but, uh, but you're right that it wasn't easy. You know, I get a question, I, I often get the question, um, uh, particularly in, in more liberal audiences, about, you know, why, why, why did he throw in the towel on the on the public option on health care. Well, uh, because if we had uh, insisted on that, we would not have passed the bill through the United States Senate. Because you didn't have the Democrats. We, because there were so many, there were a number of Democrats, Ben Nelson included, who wouldn't support any bill with a public option in it. Um, so, you know, even with the majorities, we had to really work hard, um, you know, to, to, to do what we needed to do. Um, and on health care, uh, one of the problems we faced on health care was that uh, the president was intent on trying to make it a bipartisan bill and uh, waited for six months for the Senate Finance Committee to do its work because we kept being told that Max Baucus was assembling a, a bipartisan coalition. And the president met with a number of the Republican members on that committee, some of whom had sponsored a health care law in the 90s that was much like the one that we were trying to pass. But their message was, look, uh, you know, uh, we... If you can't get uh, ten people, ten you know, ten or ten of Republicans to stand with you, I can't stand there by myself. And McConnell was enforcing tremendous discipline in the fall of. I, I wrote about this in the fall of uh, of 2009. You know, we, we there was still a hint that Olympia Snow might support the uh, health care bill, and Obama was like, "Look, we can call it the Snow Bill." Uh, he said, he said she, she could move into the White House. He said, uh, Michelle and I will get an apartment. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he, he really wanted that bill to be a bipartisan bill, but it was never going to be that way because the Republicans ordained it as such. And you were, as I recall, you were counseling to go slow on that work, worry about the economy. Well, the health care, the health care, you know, it's, it's an interesting story about him. Um, you know, my job was in part to talk to him about what the politics of some of these issues were. Uh, and, you know, I had real concerns about health care, even though I had personal incentive, a real personal incentive to see health reform. My wife, Susan's sitting down here, and we lived the problems of the health care system. Uh, our child was born at seven months old with, uh, uh, and, as she wasn't born at seven months old. <laughs> our child was born, and at seven months old, she started having seizures and those seizures continued um, and gained momentum over 19 years and we couldn't get them stopped. But in those early years, um, uh, we were paying you know, $10,000 a year out of pocket and I don't know what they were paying you at the Tribune, but they weren't paying me all that much. A lot more than that. Uh, than and, we, and, and we had insurance, but it just didn't cover her bills. So I knew, I felt so strongly about the need for reform, but my job was to talk to them about the politics and you know, seven presidents had tried, seven presidents had failed. I knew all the polling on the issue because we polled it relentlessly in the election. And it was a, it was a very, uh, it was a perilous mission uh, politically. And I made that case to him. Uh, and he, he said, yeah, he said, but if we don't do this in the first two years, it won't get done. The system will continue to uh, implode. M more people uninsured, more runaway inflation in healthcare. Uh, more of a burden on governments, businesses, and families. And he said, uh, and I, I'll never forget this, he said, well, what are we, are we gonna put our, are we supposed to put our approval rating on a shelf and just admire it for eight years? Or are we supposed to draw down on it and uh, try and do something for the country? And I, you know, even though he was essentially offering a counter argument to the argument I was making, this was exactly why I loved working for Barack Obama, because I always say I, I, I like him so much because he listened to me so little. 
there is a, uh, a passage toward the end of the book. I don't want to, it's a spoiler alert. Um, yeah. The president is yeah, really yeah, elected. I, no, don't tell him how it ends. <laughs> But there's a, there's a passage where you talked about the things that he accomplished uh, in his first t two years in the White House. And since neither of us have a book up here, I'll I have a printout here of this. Um, and you write, in the first two years in the White House, Obama accomplished more than any president since LBJ. Not only did he stanch the bleeding of an economy on the brink of disaster and passed health care reform, he also saved the American auto industry, passed landmark Wall Street reform, raised fuel efficiency standards in cars and trucks, struck down the ban on gays in the military, expanded college aid and reformed student loans, paved the way for new clean energy sources and passed the Lilly Ledbetter law to combat pay, to do, to pay discrimination against women. Um, and he also began to make good on America's longest running wars. Um, and yet, uh, you say that, uh, you point out that at some point, Nancy Pelosi called you in for a, a scolding, and she said, this is the most accomplished first two years of any president, and no one knows what he's done. And she said, it's a communications failure. Yeah. Is that true? Well, I, uh, plainly, we didn't communicate uh, that uh, to the extent that people accepted this and said, you know, uh, we are, uh, uh, we're, we're bought in. The, uh, and, and I take some responsibility for that because I was the guy in the White House who was in charge of the message. But here's the reality. Uh, he had done all those things and all those things were terrific. But the fact is the American economy was still very much in distress. Uh, people had taken a huge hit, millions of people foreclosed. Uh, wages were, uh, had taken a, a, a big hit. Uh, Washington seemed to be more uh, divided. And um, so, uh, and, and the healthcare debate, one of the liabilities of it was that it did take, it did take a lot of attention away from some of these other uh, things. So uh, I will forever think about what we might have done, could have done, and so on. But the, the fact is, it was, a, it was a, an impossible messaging uh, environment. And um, you know, I'm not sure that there was any set of circumstances under which, given where the country was uh, and where Washington was, that that soon after we got, uh, took office and after the disaster, that people were going to say, yeah, well, you know, I'm, my paycheck has shrunk, or I lost my job or my house. But you know we got um, clean energy and Lily led better and these other things. It just wasn't going to work like that. Did the president ever express his frustration about that? that yeah, I mean, that... I think that his big his biggest frustration was about health care and why we couldn't, uh, you know, seem to win the health care fight. But the reason we couldn't win it is the same reason that the other seven presidents couldn't. Um, and a part of the reason was that. Um, 85% of Americans had health care. The debate and the way it was covered focused on 15% on the 15% who didn't and the cost of insuring them. And even though the health care bill, the Affordable Care Act, included myriad things that made people more secure in their own insurance, the end of the ban on pre-existing conditions, the end of lifetime caps, uh, re rebates if the insurance companies uh, spent too much money on overhead, uh, you know, a whole range of things that made people more secure. Uh, the coverage was all focused on coverage and on the uninsured. And so the impression that we, and I just, I begged people in Congress to stick to the, to, to talk to the 85%, but, uh, but the coverage was all focused that way. And the impression was that this was a kind of a social welfare program that people didn't feel was for them. And uh, that, uh, that was problematical. When you look at the polling, when Pew was doing polling, even at the time, and I'm sure you're aware of this, that you poll all the individual components of, of Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, that nearly all of them polled at you know, 60, 70 percent approval ratings. And, and it's kind of like what's going on in Kentucky, right? Everybody, everybody right. loves Kentucky care right. or whatever, but, right. but they all hate Obamacare. It's right. the same thing. Right. Um, and this, so, so that for some reason, this, all, this, the, that this message, that the, the Tea Party message just kind of got out in front of you, and, and it was a train that you couldn't stop. Right. Well, again, I think that, um, uh, remember, when that debate was going on, it was before, there were, before the law was, was in place. So it was all speculative. So like you know, the people in Kentucky had no idea. No one did exactly how, uh, wh whether this would work for them. 
but again, you know, I think, Eric, the, the, the challenge, and this is what I said at the front end when we were talking about doing it, was that uh, it was going to be very hard to message to the vast majority of Americans who had health care uh, and uh, that the danger was it would be seen through the prism of this uh, of the 15 percent. And the public option just couldn't couldn't make it through because that would be it's all government run health care. Right. Running. Well, I mean, basically it wouldn't it couldn't make it through because uh, there were conservative Democratic senators who simply wouldn't vote for it, who bought the notion that this was you know, unfair government interference and competition. You know pretty well that uh, the mandates, that's the one aspect of the, of the Pew polling that don't poll well. Right. During the campaign, uh, then Senator Obama was blasting Hillary Clinton for supporting mandates, insurance mandates. Uh, and she went up on, on the stage and said, shame on you, Barack right. Obama. Uh, was she right? Well, I don't know about the shame on you because we were in the middle of a political campaign and um, this was not, it, they were not, you know, like the little sisters of the poor over there. They were, they were shooting real ammunition our way. But so I don't know that the, the moralizing part I don't know about. But the, uh, but look, I, the, you know, I had the, we all had a discussion with him about the mandate, the adult mandate. He took a, privately as well as publicly, he didn't say, I think this is too politically perilous. Never said that. He said he made a, a, a good faith argument about why he didn't want to move forward on it. When he became president, um, you know, the experts all told him that they couldn't think of any other way. You know, they looked at auto enrollment and other ways to get everybody in the plan, which is what it would require. And so he, he uh, yielded on that point. And one of my concerns about moving forward was that that, which is that we had taken this position in the, in the election and uh, now we were going to take the, the opposite position. Um, but, you know, his focus was on getting health care done and, and that this was a required part of that. Uh, speaking of, of uh, other changes of position, one of the things this book is getting some attention for is the part toward the end where you talk about the president's position on gay marriage. And, um, and you reveal in the book what many of us suspected all along, which is that his position on gay marriage never really changed from 1996 when he first ran for state, uh, the state senate, and he filled out a questionnaire saying that he was supported gay marriage. Uh, he then had to, I think maybe with your advice or not, he had had to had to uh, pull that back and say that he believes in e believes in equal rights, but that marriage is between a well. Man he took and a position. He 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 endorsed civil unions. And he took the position that uh, that gay couples should have uh, all the legal rights of other couples, and to le and to leave marriage aside as a sacrament. Uh, and um, what I said was that he never was terribly comfortable with that position. And you know, he did an interview with BuzzFeed last week that got some attention. First of all, the fact that the president of the United States is does interviews with BuzzFeed, tells you how much the media landscape has changed yeah. over time. So uh, I bet you there are a lot of BuzzFeed readers here, actually, uh, in, on this, you know, among the students. But, uh, but in it, he, he, you know, everybody, first of all, the, there was these was the screaming headlines off of the book saying, Obama lied about this. That, that's not, I wouldn't characterize what I wrote that way. But, he, what he said was, I had my private position and I had the position, my, my public position, and I was frustrated uh, trying to reconcile the two. And that's pretty much what I wrote. Uh, but let me just say something about this. The history of social progress in this country is replete with it, uh, examples of leaders who uh, picked the time and place when they um, moved forward on some of these questions. There was a lot of frustration among Lincoln supporters about the pace at which he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, Roosevelt, you know, uh, passed Social Security in a way that essentially excluded most of most African Americans in the country because of the type of work that they did. But he did it because he felt over time these things would be rectified, and this was the only way he could pass it with the support of Southern Democrats. And later, you know, he. Uh, he uh, campaigned as a kind of faux isolationist uh, when he was maneuvering to get the country into uh, World War II. Um, I don't think Lincoln was a liar. I don't think Roosevelt was a liar. I think political leaders have to read the environment and make judgments as to how to move uh, the country forward. 
And the real question is, at the end of the day, what did they do? And when history looks back at Barack Obama, he'll be the president who ended Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, withdrew the government support for DOMA, thus uh, dooming it uh, as a law, and ultimately endorsed gay marriage at a time when he added uh, real acceleration to the movement, uh, to the point now where it isn't even going to be an issue in 2012, except in maybe in some Republican debates. You know. 16. The next 16, year, 16, yeah. 16, yes. Yeah. 16. So uh, uh, he will be remembered as the president who did more on this issue uh, in moving the country forward than any other. And that's sort of the history of leadership in our country. But I wanted, I mean, the reason I ask about that is, is that, you know, you, the, the book obviously, it's, you know, it's Believer, but there's something a little bit cynical about, about giving an answer. I'm not saying he's lying, but, but, in, but in not just speaking the truth. I mean, this is a guy at the, at the Jefferson Jackson Day dinner says, you know, we must give Americans the answers that they must hear rather than the ones they want to mm -hmm. hear. I mean, the, 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 he's got this idealistic streak, and I, obviously you do too, but there's also this pragmatic streak, and maybe cynicism is too, is too strong a term to use. But I think it is too strong. When you're, when what, he would say is, what he would say is that he was trying to reconcile uh, his belief that there ought to be equal rights with very strong feelings uh, and you know he, he represented a mostly African American district among the clergy and others, and he was trying to reconcile those two things. And he acknowledges that it was a clumsy attempt to reconcile those two things. So there, you, you know, there, there, you can interpret it uh, as you will. I, I, you know, I don't think that's particularly cynical. And I think in a democracy, you know, and as I said in our history, there are all kinds of examples uh, like this. But what he did do was maneuver this issue in such a way. I mean, I was there when he called the military in early in the administration and said, I'm here, I'm not here to ask you, I'm here to tell you that we're going to end Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and what I'm asking for is your cooperation in doing this in a way that would be least disruptive to the force. And he painstakingly maneuvered through uh, this until we finally passed a law uh, at the end of uh, those two years. And there were times during that period when uh, a lot of activists in the gay community were very angry that he didn't just by executive order uh, end that, uh, end that uh, policy, but that would not have uh, been sufficient uh, given the fact that it was a law. And uh, uh, so, the, you know, this is sort of how leadership works. Uh, and the question is, are you pointed in the right direction? Are you m moving effectively in the right direction? I think on these issues, uh, history is pretty clear. Well, and not only that, I think that, I mean, if you remember 2004 was the year that Republicans had, had uh, petitioned to have lots of gay marriage referenda on, on uh, ballots yeah, in states the all over Carl the country, Rose, right? and it was a real wedge issue, and it was designed to boost Republican turnout, um, obviously. Wait a second, which side are you arguing? Um, no, I'm, say, I'm, 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 I'm just... <laughs> no, no, I'm, I know, I know. Look, yeah. I, my, no, no I, that he, my, my thing is that I, I am not offended as an idealist uh, by... Uh, those kinds of decisions because you have to be pragmatic enough to bring this progress about. Uh, and, you know, you, you, it's, it's one thing if you're a, like a talk show host or, you know, with all due respect, a columnist. Sure, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it's another thing if you're uh, an actor in the arena and you're trying to move these issues forward. Right, when he, and was, my point is I think he, not, he could not have been elected in 2004 uh, if he had been... Open well, I mean, the politics of that election were that, uh, you know, a lot of his support was, uh, a lot of that race was hinging on, uh, you know, overwhelming support in the African-American community where the church was, you know, uh, you know vehemently opposed to, uh, to this. So, I mean, I think that was just one issue of the many that you raised. And yes, the whole environment that year was hostile. I hate to talk to all this all the time about Obama because you had a, a career before him. Yeah, and you were there for I was there for a lot of it, yeah. Um, you left the Tribune, an interesting story, you left it because they messed with the story. And basically that was well, the final story, Well, I mean, story, it was right? a long process. I mean, and you, you're in a unique position to understand um, some of this. I got there in 1976. And it was a great place to work because there was this sort of front page kind of gestalt to the place. Everything was for the story. Editors got as excited about stories as you did. Uh, I got a lot of support and encouragement, um, you know, at the, at the uh, paper. I think maybe I hope that some of our old editors, Bernie Judge told me he was going to be here. Bernie, are you here? There he is. My, my first city editor. And... Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, mine, mine too. And, and for you too. And uh, I, kn I always knew that Bernie would be as excited about a great story as I was and that he'd give me support no matter who I was writing about or what obstacles would be in the way. And we had a change of management at the Tribune, and you were there for that as well. It became a much more uh, bottom line oriented group, brought in a different editorial team. Their basic uh, view, uh, we were, we were uh, really supported during the old era. In the new era, the attitude was basically there are a thousand people who want job, your job. So you don't need a pat on the back. You don't need our encouragement. Just do it. And um, so it became a less fun place to work, beyond which, you know, uh, uh, decisions that were made uh, bothered me. I wrote a, a piece, uh, I remember uh, this uh, so clearly, uh, during the 1983 mayoral race, Harold Washington's race, I wrote a uh, piece about, late in the campaign, about a letter that former Governor Ogilvie had written on behalf of Jane Byrne to voters on the northwest side of Chicago, basically saying a vote for Daley is a vote for Harold Washington. And the racial undertones were really, really clear. And I wrote the piece, and it got uh, basically buried in the newspaper. Years later, Jim Squires, who was the editor of the paper uh, at the time, wrote a book and said one of his greatest regrets is that we missed the racial uh, undertones of the campaign. Well, you know, maybe he missed it, but I didn't miss it. And uh, so I was frustrated about that. And then I was covering the 1984 presidential race, and I was covering Gary Hart. I was sent to Iowa. I had written a piece as early suggesting Hart could break through. He, Walter Mondale was the front runner. And uh, Hart was a young senator from Colorado. And uh, he did break through, came second in Iowa, and then broke through in New Hampshire. And I wanted to write a piece now, because he was going down south, about how the quintessential liberal in some ways. He had managed George McGovern's campaign in 1972, had a 95% rating from the Americans for Democratic Action, the kind of litmus test of liberalism. I want to write a story about how he planned to run in the more conservative South. And it was a really, he, Gary Hart is one of the, 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 the savviest people that I've ever met in politics. And he had thought through his strategy, and it, it was pretty well conceived. And uh, I wrote this whole piece up, stayed up all night writing the speech, turned it into paper, got back to the paper a few days later, and they had taken all the quotes from my story and all the quotes from w the Walter Mondale story and basically turned it into what would amount to a wire service story about what everybody had said that day. And I went to the national editor and I said, well, why do you have us out there if all you're going to do is this? And he said, well, we didn't really have the news hold. So. And I said, you know, Associated Press does a great job. You don't need us. And I was just very frustrated. And I thought, well, if this is the future, maybe, you know, I didn't want to do journalism in a way that I didn't believe in. And so uh, Paul Simon had been on me, Congressman Paul Simon from Southern Illinois, running for the Senate, been on me for some time to go to work for him. And uh, I finally uh, decided it was, I would jump, in part because Simon was someone I knew would never embarrass me. And he was someone with whom I had a lot in common. He had started a newspaper when he was 19, used it to crusade against a political machine down there, uh, got elected to the legislature, crusaded for civil rights, even though he was from a very southern district, uh, for political reform, which wasn't popular in Springfield. And uh, I really admired him, so I, I uh, decided that maybe it was time to, to go to what some of our old colleagues uh, would call the dark side. Did you ever think he might come back? Or? Well, I don't know. Some, you know, Doug Nealon, remember Doug Nealon? Sure. He was an editor. He took me aside. He closed the door, and he started screaming at me about how I was destroying my career, and you could never come back. And, but I honestly, you know, I, oh, I, I still revere journalism. I love journalism. I feel like I was raised in the Chicago Tribune newsroom. I started there when I was 21 years old, two years after my father had died, to whom I was very close. And the Tribune became my family. My editors became my mentors, and, uh, and I loved being a reporter. It was a great gig. Uh, but I, I just had this sense that it was, gonna cha it was changing, and I didn't want to be a part of that uh, change. So uh, I, never, I don't think I ever, I mean, Susan's down there. I, I don't think I ever said, gee, I wish I was back there. Did I ever say that? No. no. <laughs> We're going to open up the floor. Uh, I'm getting older, so I got to double check. Yeah, we're going to open up the floor to questions, and we'd like to give students priority, and we want to make sure that the uh, questions are kept short. No speeches. Questions, please. Um, while they're lining up, well, let me ask you. Um, they're not lining up. Well, 
I'm so just going to leave it to me then yes. to ask the tough questions. Go back to 2005, right after uh, you, you, Barack Obama sworn into the U.S. Senate. I'm writing a column saying he's going to run for president. He's saying he's not, but you're behind the scenes. You guys are talking to him saying that he might do it. But the, my question is, if you would go back and give that David Axelrod's advice, don't let the president go bowling, what else? Well, <laughs> that bo uh, I'll tell you, the bowling thing was totally my fault. Because uh, my, my, one of the things, one of the consequences of my daughter's illness was that um, um, there were not that, there were, th she was limited in the things she could do. And so one of the things we used to do together that was our activity was bowling. And I loved bowling and I spent a lot of time in bowling alleys uh, when she was young. And one of the things I noticed was that people, uh, when you're bowling, uh, one person's bowling and everybody else is sitting around. So what I suggested was, go to a bowling alley in Pennsylvania and shake hands with people who are waiting to bowl. Uh, I never said, you bowl. <laughs> uh, that was somebody else's idea oh, on the oh. scene. Uh, I had no idea whether he could bowl or not. I, will, I must report, though, one of the benefits of being president of the United States is that you have your own bowling alley. And uh, the president has become quite a good bowler. I would imagine, yeah. yeah he's very he competitive, so he, he that's something that's eaten at him. He rolled, he rolled a 37, which I don't, even, I don't even know how you do that. No. It's so no. bad. And he's it's a very athletic guy, very competitive, and I just can't imagine that. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe he didn't understand the rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello, how are you? Um, so in 2008, uh, you changed the mode of campaign finance to be more based on private donations. And following on from that in 2012, uh, the Republicans are also doing private donations, but they're much, much better at it than the Democrats overall. Do you feel that this There's is a, a bad thing, and what lies ahead in the future for private donations? So really, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fair question, and one of the things I talk about in the book was um, what our role was in uh, blowing up the campaign finance system. Uh, in 2004, uh, John Kerry was run, running for president, and he, st he stayed within the campaign finance system, and an organization called Swift Boat Veterans for Truth launched a campaign against him uh, that uh, ended up damaging his candidacy in a big way. And we were intent on not allowing that to happen to us, and so uh, we had to make a decision uh, and, and we felt like if we were limited to the 80 million or whatever it was that we could spend under the system in the general election, that we would, could be vulnerable uh, to these third party attacks. And so uh, we, we made a decision not to operate within the system. We, uh, you know, a, a, large, uh, a fair amount of our money came from small donations online, which was great. It was sort of the democratization funding. A lot of it didn't. But the result of it was it added to this proliferation of uh, money in, in politics. Um, and uh, I mean, it was badly exacerbated by the Supreme Court uh, ruling in 2010 that allowed essentially unlimited spending uh, and third party spending by corporations and others. Um, that's been, you know, and much of it on undisclosed. I'm concerned about, I'm very concerned about money in politics. I, I don't accept that uh, in our democracy, the more money you have, the more power uh, you should have. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a concern. But uh, I will say this about campaign finance reform, and it may not be popular with some here, but um, I think that, you know, campaign finance reforms, which began after Watergate here in, in the 70s, are, are well-intentioned. They're, uh, uh, and, they're, um, and they're motivated by the right instinct, which I guess is the same as well-intentioned. But, uh, but what I've found is that we've basically created a cottage industry for lawyers who figure out ways to circumvent the system. And we've managed to make the system sneakier, but not necessarily better in many ways. And what I really think we need to do, at least as a start on reform, is pass, and we tried and the Republicans blocked it, pass a law that uh, makes full disclosure of every dollar that's spent, whether it's a third party dollar or whether it's a party dollar or whether it's a candidate dollar, fully disclosed. So at least people know where the money is coming from because more and more of this money is dark money. We don't know where it's coming from. And there's something very insidious about that.
Thank you very much. Hi, you just spoke um, about what the president was doing over his first two years in office. And one of the things I kept thinking of, what about the main thing he didn't do, which was indict anyone on Wall Street for their, what they were doing in 2008? And the question was, why didn't that happen? Why hasn't anything been done about it? And to give you an example, in New York State, there's something called the Martin Act, yes. where New York State can indict people on Wall Street. And that has happened, at least in the, uh, the civil realm. Why hasn't the president done anything in that realm um, since 2008 to combat um, anything that happened on Wall Street in 2008 and, in effect, created this two-level system where you say people on Wall Street play on one level, everyone else plays on the other? You know, I'm glad you raised the Martin Act. I sure wish we had that at the national level. It's a great tool. Uh, and one of the problems that we confronted after the, uh, after the uh, crisis was how uh, inadequate uh, the laws were uh, governing the financial sector. And we had a titanic struggle with, the, the, uh, with Wall Street and some of the fa financial community over the uh, Dodd-Frank law, uh, which, uh, while not perfect, um, has given more tools to police uh, uh, Wall Street and hopefully will uh, discourage some of the chicanery that we saw. Certainly there's more transparency in the derivatives markets than there were before. There's a Consumer Finance Protection Bureau which the industry fought mightily to keep people from being exploited in the way that they were before uh, the crisis. So uh, I think that uh, uh, a lot of the answer lies in the inadequacy of the laws that uh, we had to work with. And you're right that uh, uh, Elliot Spitzer and his successor in New York as Attorney General, uh, uh, Andrew Cuomo, and then, and, and then uh, uh, to the Attorney General today, uh, are all, uh, have all made use of the Martin Act, uh, and it's good that they have that tool. There, is, there wasn't such a tool uh, for us, and uh, it, was a gaping, uh, it was a gaping hole. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Axelrod, in uh, 2014, the uh, Republicans gained a majority in the Senate as well as the House, and their mandate seems, I could be wrong, but it seems <laughs> to be to uh, basically erase what Obama has done. So my question is, how confident are you that Obama's reforms, all of his accomplishments, will endure? It's a good question. I would also be a little bit uh, wary. I mean, I know some Republicans may interpret the vote in 2014 as such a mandate. I mean, there are some Republicans who believe that uh, mandates are delivered in uh, non-presidential years, but in presidential years, the vote means nothing. <laughs> um, but uh, Too many people vote, that's why. <laughs> but uh, but I, I honestly think if you look at polling, I think that uh, even those who voted uh, for Republicans in 2014, there are many of, them, many of the folks who voted who, who don't want to refight the old battles, who didn't send this Congress there to try and repeal for the 75th time, you know, the health bill, uh, the health law, or repeal financial reform, or, uh, or block uh, environmental regulations. So uh, they, they, they really want to see uh, Governing, they want to see things happen, and I, I, I sense that the Republican leadership, um, you know, is wrestling with that. They haven't exactly gotten out of the box cleanly here, and they're having a lot of internal strife. The latest being over the issue of immigration reform and whether they'll allow the Department of Homeland Security to essentially go unfunded in order to try and pressure the president into relenting on immigration reform. Uh, I think that I, I, John McCain, I was on Meet the Press yesterday, he was on Meet the Press, and he rightly said it's a stupid idea. Um, so uh, I think that there may be some Republicans who interpret the mandate that way, but I don't think most Republicans, even most Republicans in Washington do. And I think some of these things that the president has done, I think it's going to be very hard, I know the Supreme Court has to speak on this, very hard to reverse health care reform now when more than 10 million people have coverage who didn't have it and when there are protections on pre-existing conditions and some of these other things that never existed before. I don't think the public wants to go back uh, on those. And immigration reform, the president's taken this first step. Uh, I don't think there's going to be an appetite for going backward uh, on that. And uh, down the line, I think he's 
uh, taken steps that, that, that people are going to want to see. They may want to see some adjustments made. They may, want to, they may feel like we can do things better. Obviously, in immigration reform, we need a law, not just an executive order. Uh, but I don't think we're going backwards. I think we're, we're going forward, and that was one of the reasons why he was so intent on running for re-election and winning re-election. Thank you. Hi. Hello. I'm curious about something that I read in Mark Leibovich's first book, which is <laughs> that the Obama administration came into Washington as sort of outsiders, and there was a ban against lobbyists and a sort of ethos of not getting too involved in the Washington insider scene. And Leibovich wrote that it sort of didn't work out and there's a lot of um, the revolving door between lobbying and various Washington insider parties and the administration. And I'm curious if you think that that's really true and why it happened and if it says something about Washington. I don't think that in the, you know, I think in the administration itself, in the White House, uh, I don't think that's uh, true. I mean, there are exceptions. There have been a few exceptions. But the rule has basically been that there's been a ban on, uh, on the revolving door, and there's these, these two-year uh, strictures against uh, such, revolving, uh, such a revolving door. I know when I left, there were pretty strict strictures about who I could. I, I didn't take any other clients excuse me, but the re-election campaign when I left in 2011, because if I had, I could not have initiated a call to anyone in the White House if I had a client who had any interests before the administration. That didn't exist uh, before. So, you know, it, it, it is, it, has it been pristine? Has there been, have there been any sort of shading anywhere? I, I can't say that that's uh, the case that's been pristine, but has it been light years different than it was before, uh, absolutely. And, and I'm proud of the fact that basically you've had an administration that's been in place for six years um, in which there hasn't been a major scandal. Uh, and I think that says a lot about the ethical yeah. strictures you know, uh, of this administration. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Axelrod, thank you for being here. Um, my question, in your book, I'm going to raise this a little bit. In your book, um, you say that you believe that uh, a successful candidate must be the remedy and not the replica of a current office holder. I believe I'm stating that correctly. And without asking you to be too critical of the current president, um, my question because to you. Because plainly, I've been too <laughs> critical of him. <laughs> my question is what do you believe um, the next um, candidate for president will need to? Well, let me just you? explain my theory. My theory and it's been honed over years of participating in, uh, in um, these elections, is that when an incumbent retires, people, the, 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 the electorate re never chooses a replica of what they have in terms of style and approach. They almost always choose the remedy to what they see as the shortcomings of that incumbent. And that was one of the reasons why I thought Obama had a good chance in 2008 because he was so different than George Bush in the way he approached politics and his style. He also had opposed the war in Iraq, obviously important. But this was more about style than, uh, than any particular issue. Uh, and, you know, Bush had saw the world in kind of Manichaean terms, black and white, and uh, people were looking for a president who could see the nuances, see the gray, and deal with them and the complexities of the world that, uh, uh, as he found them. Them. And they got that in Barack Obama. But the nature of this is that people tend then to say, well, maybe, maybe we've gone too far in that direction. Maybe I want someone who's a little less nuanced. Maybe I want someone who's a little more sees the world in black and white terms. Maybe I don't want someone who's going to challenge the system in Washington. Maybe I want someone who can manage the system in Washington. And I suspect that's the kind of candidate who is likely to emerge from, so uh, who from is this. That? Who is that? <laughs> You want me to do all the work? <laughs> yes, I do. Um, well, I mean, you know, people always ask me about Hillary Clinton because we uh, ran a campaign and we beat her in those primaries. Um, but uh, I honestly think on the Democratic side that she's better positioned now than she was in 2008 because she is sort of that person. She's not quite as nuanced as Obama. She is someone who people feel... Uh, 
for whatever reason, that she has a better capacity for sort of managing the system. And that was the argument she was making in 2008, that she understood how the system worked, she knew how to work the system. I think people are gonna be more, uh, more uh, willing to accept that argument in 2016. And, and likewise, on the Republican side, I think there's gonna be a premium on people. You know, you're gonna hear the Republican governor say, I worked and you know, I was able to work uh, in a uh, blue state or a bipartisan basis. So Jeb Bush obviously is gonna talk, I mean, implicit is that he's, he knows how to work the system, I think you're going to get a governor, not a senator, uh, coming out of that uh, process. As a Democrat, which Republican are you the most afraid of in 2016? You know, it's a funny thing about the presidential process because, you know, sitting here in the uh, winter of 2015 and trying to project ahead is like reading the farmer, Farmer's Almanac in a way. <laughs> you, you, you know, you, you really need to see how people handle the real life pressures of running for president. It's a crazy, sometimes uh, a maddening process, but you are tested and, and, and the bar keeps getting raised. So Scott Walker, for example, from Wisconsin is someone who is the, uh, one of the early sort of interesting candidates in, in the minds of the odds makers because he has a foot in both the right and the uh, center right camps. Uh, he's a governor, um, you know, he's got good political skills seemingly. Uh, but we don't know how he's going to handle the tests that come. Um, you know, maybe it was a good move uh, uh, that in the way he answered the evolution question, where he said he's going to punt uh, on that. I, I mean, I, in, in, I mean, he may think for his purposes in the primary. That, but you get these tests every single day when you're running for president. So we'll see how he holds you, up. In the, the, but, but so you know, he could be strong. He, he might not be. Uh, Jeb Bush to me is interesting because he has said he's going to stick to his guns on immigration reform, on uh, education reform, and he's not going to trim his sails in order to be the nominee. Well, there's huge opposition in the activist wing of the Republican Party on those issues. Um, if he succeeds in winning the nomination uh, and without trimming his sails, I think he could be a very formidable candidate, but that's a big if. In 2007, you told Barack Obama you, you were worried that he wasn't pathological enough right. to run for president. Right. He, did he I meant that, that in a good way. In a good way. <laughs> Thanks, Bess. Thank you. Um, I, I said that because um, running for president is an unbelievable ordeal. And you, you have to have almost pathological drive to pull yourself out of bed every single morning at four in the morning and do these 20 hour days and deal with the pressures and sometimes the, the really irritating stupidity of the process. You know, the questions that are, you know, you, know, you put the, a comma in a wrong place or, you know, why are you wearing that tie and not this tie? The flag, your lapel pin. Yeah, right, exactly. And, um, and I was worried because he seemed, you know, he, he seemed too normal to me. Uh, to do that, and he acknowledged that, and we had an interesting conversation. He said, well, it's true, and he said, kind of like being with my family, I like flopping down and watching football with my friends. He said, I like my, he said, you know, being Barack Obama, it turns out, is not a bad gig, and I don't, and I like it. He said, but if you're going to do public service, then do it at the level where you can have the greatest impact, and he said, and if I get in, um, you know, I'm very competitive, and I, I'm not getting in to lose. And for six months, he was a very bad candidate. I mean, in my view, I think he'd acknowledge that. He was unhappy. He didn't, he just, you know, he, he didn't accept sort of the, the absurdity of it all. It irritated him. Um, he was kind of half a step behind. And he challenged himself to, to become a better candidate. So that competitiveness really did uh, click in. But I'll tell you, when Sarah Palin got chosen to be the vice presidential nominee, why does that make everybody chuckle? <laughs> That's just a historical fact. <laughs> um, it's a funny one. Yeah. I, uh, I was the one who told Obama that she had been chosen. I was on the back of his campaign plane in Denver. I went to the front of the plane. I said, we just got word he's chosen Sarah Palin. And he was like, that's really interesting. What do you think the calculation was? I guess she really represents change in a way that no one else would. And he goes through all But then he said, uh, uh, he said, but I'll tell you this. He said, uh, she may be the greatest politician uh, since Ronald Reagan, and she can come out of Alaska after a year and handle this media maelstrom. 
But uh, I, I'd give this three or four weeks, and let's see how she does. And like four weeks later, she did that interview with Katie Couric, <laughs> and that was the end. And it was, he said, I think I'm reasonably smart, and I had a really hard time learning how to deal with this. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, and that, you know, and then uh, <laughs> Joe Biden came bounding up, and he said, uh, what's going on? We said, we picked, uh, you know, he picked Sarah Palin, and uh, Biden said, who's Sarah Palin? <laughs> <laughs> Which probably was like the average American, yeah. right, at the time. Yeah. Oh, um, I haven't had the privilege of reading your book yet, but I have read uh, many of your newspaper articles. Really? I, I have. You um, don't look that old. I, I, well, I, I read them for, uh, for a book that, that I'm working on oh. uh, about the Chicago Defender. Um, and I noticed that in, even back in 1977, when you were covering the Harold Washington campaign, where he got a very low total of the vote, you still saw something there, something yeah. kind of powerful and, yeah. and magical. And then in 83, you were one of the few people at the Tribune, really anywhere in, in the white media, that saw something um, there. And I, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, to, uh, just historically for you to talk a little bit about that and if there was something, a, a thread, either spiritual or electoral, that you saw uh, with respect to, to President Well, when Obama. I came here in, in 1972, um, it was at, right after the Black Panther slayings on the west side. Um, it was when Ralph Metcalf, who was the congressman here, longtime cog in the machine, had broken with Mayor Daley over police brutality. Uh, uh, and there was a lot of um, ferment in the black community. And uh, Harold, it struck me, uh, articulated that um, better than anyone. He felt it. Harold was offended. He was a product of the machine, and he resented it, and he felt it deeply. Uh, he felt the indignities that, uh, uh, that that had inflicted on him, and by extension, others. And, and, and he, as we all, as not we all, because there are plenty of people who weren't born when he was alive, but uh, for those of us who were, I mean, he was incredibly charismatic and powerful. And so, um, you know, I always was impressed by that and thought that he... Um, you know, he was going to be a big factor uh, down the line. And, uh, you know, one of the great um, privileges I had was watching, was covering the 1983 mayoral race um, because it was such a historic uh, battle. And, uh, um, and Harold, as you'll remember, won because there were televised debates that were widely carried. And he was so commanding in those debates that it galvanized the African-American community, much of the liberal white community, and allowed him to win. He was, uh, as he would say, sui generis. <laughs> and, and was there a connection to the, to the president that you saw? I mean, as I said. You know, um, it is one of my, my deep regrets that uh, the only, they only had one encounter when, he, when, when Obama was a young community organizer and actually organized an event to protest something the mayor was doing. And that was the only time that they ever, in, I don't know that they ever even exchanged a word. And I've always thought, you know, Harold was a really remarkable bot because he could be a street brawler, but he was, an, uh, he was a real intellectual as well. You'd go to his home and it was floor to ceiling books. And he's just such an interesting guy and great sense of humor. I'll tell you one story. I, I, after I crossed over to the dark side, um, I worked for him in 1987 on his re-election campaign. And uh, Jane Byrne came back and was running against him in a primary and was doing better, frankly, than she deserved to. And, um, uh, but it was, you know, the race, it, racial issue still hung over this. And uh, we fought back, and he ended up winning the primary by 80,000 votes, and uh, we were sitting in his office at City Hall the next day, and he was about to do a press conference, and he said, say, what percentage of the white vote did I get? Someone said, 21%. And he said, 21%. Uh, and they said, yeah, but you got 8% last time, so you're making progress here. And he said, 21%. He said, you know, I've probably spent 70% of my time in those white neighborhoods. I've tried so hard to be a good mayor for the whole city, and I got 21% of the white vote, and we're happy about it. And he kind of smiled and he said, ain't it a bitch to be a black man in the land of the free and the home of the brave? <laughs> and uh, that was Harold, you know. And uh, I think he and Obama, I think he would have been a great sort of mentor and uh, friend 
uh, to Obama. And it's one of my great regrets that they never had a chance to really know each other. I think they would have really loved each other. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi. So um, I apologize because I, I haven't read the book either yet. Um, but I have a question. I also have four kids. Um, two of them have special needs. One has epilepsy and one has autism. And um, I'm wondering how your experience is as a parent and going through the, sort of the healthcare system, you know, a few years before me, um, Many, affected yeah. your, <laughs> your politics and your sort of ideas about healthcare now. And then also sort of um, what things maybe Obamacare hasn't addressed that could be improved? Mm -hmm. Well, um, on the first question, uh, you know, what, I, what we experienced was that we thought we had insurance and we thought that we were protected. And uh, um, she started having these seizures. They told us at first that it was, they were febrile, fever related, and that she would get over it in a day or two. And a month later, she was still having 10 seizures a day. And uh, they gave her one and two. There weren't that many medications then. The me medications didn't work. And we, you know, someone back then when she was a child suggested, a small child brain surgery, we wanted to get a second opinion because it seemed so dramatic. Uh, a step, and we couldn't, under the insurance, get that. We had to pay for that, uh, which was hugely expensive. And um, so, um, you know, I just, it was, we felt ill served uh, by the healthcare system uh, for many, many years. Um, and hopefully, some of that uh, would be addressed by this, in that we couldn't even move, we couldn't change our healthcare policy because we had a child with pre-existing uh, conditions. And um, so we felt stuck, and we felt left alone and abandoned in that regard. Um, you know, I, I feel remiss. I know that, that this health, the healthcare, there's gonna be, there have to be uh, changes made over time based on experience in the healthcare system to improve it, not to dismantle it, but to improve it. But you know, I see Dr. Siegler uh, sitting here who's uh, uh, an expert on these questions. I don't purport to be. Uh, and so I, I'm gonna, to borrow a phrase from Scott Walker, punt on this issue. I do believe in evolution, but I don't That's know how fair. to answer. <laughs> I don't know quite how to answer this question, but I do know um, that, that I do know the challenges that are associated with having a child with special needs, and I will say that, um, just as an aside, uh, we have to do a much better job, not just for children, but particularly for adults with special needs who are largely abandoned, and here in the state of Illinois, particularly, we have an egregious uh, system here in terms of supporting adults with uh, disabilities, and um, I think it's a tremendous blight uh, on our state, and I hope uh, that uh, sometime down the line we can address that issue and well before uh, your children might need uh, some of what, uh, what is missing today. Thanks. I think we can, can we get these through these last three questions real quickly, maybe just because of where I think we're running yeah, into time here. Yeah, I got you. Here, so. And, and those of you who haven't read the book, it's going to be for, on sale out in the lobby, right? And yeah, Dan's going to be signing it, so yes, no excuses. Yes, I hope you'll come by. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Are you familiar with Andrew Basevich's work? No. Well, it's about Washington rules and the military-industrial complex. And I could never understand why Obama sent troops into Afghanistan, the first 17,000 and then another 11 given his position about the war. And mm -hmm. I could only imagine that he was under great pressure. My, my rationale is that he was under great pressure from uh, the military, as we have again. Uh, and wonder if you could address that. Well, I, I, I would say brief, briefly that um, uh, what we were faced with was a situation where um, there really was a threat directed at us from that region. This, this is why it differed from Iraq, and bin Laden was still free, as were uh, most of the leadership of al-Qaeda. 
And uh, so, you know, that when you're, when you're reading Intelligence Every Day, uh, you feel that responsibility. But there also were pressures that I, and there's a whole chapter in this book on that very question, so um, I urge you to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. One of the big stories in 2014 was the lack of turnout by Democrats. The Republicans hit their marks, and the, Repub the Democratic turnout was dramatically lower than in the presidential years. Even though the president's approval ratings were kind of low, they were still high among Democrats. So did Democratic candidates make a mistake by not tying themselves to the president? Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think this is a persistent problem. There's a third drop-off in off-year elections, and it's primarily young people, minorities, and uh, voters who are part of the so-called Obama coalition. But I think that it was a terrible mistake not to have the president out there. I would have liked to have seen, and I urged uh, him to uh, make the kind of speech he made at the State of the Union a year earlier mm -hmm. and really frame the debate, because I think there are big differences in terms of how these two parties see the economy. But uh, there was a decision on the part of the Democratic leadership, particularly on the Senate side, that six of their races were a competitive race, six of their incumbent races were in states where he had lost by an average of 19 points in 2012, and they thought he'd be a liability out there. Here's the lesson. You can never run away from a president of your own party. Mm -hmm. So at least get the upside of having him out there articulating a strong message and defining the race. And I think it was a terrible mistake. How, I, I, you know, I don't think necessarily those six would have won Otherwise, but I do think that there are states, some of, in some of the more marginal states, it would have made a difference. And uh, I, I, I deeply regret it. I suspect he does too. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Here we go. No, that, that was, was the last. Oh, question. No, oh, oh, I say you're just waiting. Would okay. you let, if you didn't, if you knew that that was the last question, would you have let me give longer answers? Yes, <laughs> I would have. I mean, I, well, and, but to make up for you, I want to give you a wrap-up question here. The title of the book uh, is okay. Believer. What do you mean by that? What do you believe in? What is, what, give me the, the I believe, I believe, what do you believe in? I believe in? that there is meaning in politics. I believe that this is a worthy thing to be involved in. I, I've seen, as messy and as maddening as the process is, I've seen real meaningful change that has touched people's lives. And, uh, and, I, and I think we have the ability to do that. And we do have the ability to de determine the quality of our future and to make a difference uh, through this process. So, um, and that was what, you know, that's what JFK and RFK were talking about 40 years ago. I've experienced it and I've seen it. And I think we have to fight back against this persistent cynicism that says that uh, there is no point, that, that there is no difference, that we shouldn't bother being involved. Um, I think that's a, 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 a toxic notion in our uh, in, our po in our society, and we, we need to, my, my whole point in being here at the Institute of Politics is to try and urge uh, these young people who have huge concerns about a whole range of issues to get in there and make a difference and steer us in the right place, because I, as I always tell them, Congress is going to meet with them or without them, <laughs> and, uh, and it's best to, to not to avert your eyes, but to get in there and, uh, and, and make the case uh, for the direction you think we ought to go. And I really believe it. I, it's been a great career for me to be involved, a great calling for me to be involved in this. Uh, and I want to urge others to take the same path. All right, David Atzerai. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking David and Eric Zorn of the Chicago Tribune. We thank you all so much for being here. I also want to point out that David will be in the lobby signing books, um, which will be for sale. The lobby is near the middle of the building as you go through this passageway, so we encourage you to line up and purchase books and have those signed. Thanks again for being here. We wish you all a great and pleasant evening.